Good evening, everyone. So what I have for you tonight is what could be a very short teaching. And then we're going to do like we've done the last couple weeks and split up into the groups. Personally, I've really been enjoying that. I think we're really on to something. You know, a lot of churches, they have the small groups, and it's just like your one set group, same people every time, go to somebody's house. But I love the way we're doing this because you wind up with different people, and we're getting to know people that we've never really talked to very much in church before. And I think that's great. So I definitely want to leave some time for that. Uh, I want to talk to you about prayer. During Brother Borg's teaching on Saturday morning, the Holy Spirit was just really moving on my heart, opening some things up to me. And I didn't come to reteach his teaching. I really encourage you to go back on Facebook and watch that. I'm not teaching the Lord's Prayer, but I have a few things to share with you out of Jesus' lead up to the Lord's Prayer and some verses on prayer and other places to, in the Bible. And just, again, trying to open up to you some things that God opened up to me. So first I want to just share a little testimony about the way I've viewed prayer over the years. I, before I came to this church, I was involved in the Word of Faith movement. I went to Resurrection Life Fellowship. Before that, I would read all the Kenneth Hagin books and Creflo Dollar and all these Word of Faith type people. And a lot of what they teach is things along the lines of, if you pray the right way, you say the right words, say them over and over, that's how you get God to move. It's all about doing it the right way. It's like a formula. And when I came here, I understood that it's not about what I do. My victory, my righteousness before God, all things that pertain to life and godliness are a free gift. They don't come to me through what I do but they come to me through faith in what Christ has done. And I understood faith to be believing something in your heart. It says in the beginning of Romans 4.4, 4, Abraham believed God, and it, his faith, was counted unto him for righteousness. Faith and belief are used interchangeably. And I've, I've read the story of when Peter went to preach the gospel to Cornelius and his household, the first Gentiles to ever hear the gospel, and we're told that while Peter was yet speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who believed. And so I could see there, they didn't do one single thing. They didn't say one word. They just believed in their heart, and that was enough. God purified their hearts by faith, the Bible says, and He gave them the Holy Spirit on what they believed in their heart alone. So last time Brother Borg was here, it was maybe three or four years ago, I'm not sure, he gave this teaching and says some things about this is how you pray. And at the time, because I had come out of this word of faith thing, it all sounded very formulaic to me. In some ways, it sounded very similar to what I came out of. And I even texted Pastor Mike, and we had a big argument back and forth via text about the role of prayer. And, and I've kind of, you know, if you listen to Bob Cornell very much, he talks about people like me who, because they come out of law as it regards prayer, it's like they're so afraid to get back into law that they can't receive just simple things that the Bible says about things that we are supposed to do. Even though I'm not righteous, I'm not victorious because of what I do, the Bible does tell me to do some things. And Jesus, something that really stuck out to me in Brother Borg's teaching, he told us a manner in which we should pray. And I know that Jesus said at one point to the disciples, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things which I say? And what he's saying is, you can call me Lord all you want, but your heart is far from me if you're not actually doing the things I say. So I felt some conviction about this. Here's my Lord, my Savior. He says in this manner, pray. And I'm, I'm just getting in this mindset where it's like, no, it doesn't matter how I pray one way or the other. It's all the blood of Jesus. It's the cross. And just kind of just taking that too far the other way. And instead of putting good works and obedience in the proper perspective, just in some regards, pushing them out altogether. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about. And I'm going to go through what Jesus said here leading up to this, and I want to point some things out about it, about the manner in which he taught to pray. 
And also, before I get into that, I wanted to share an analogy with you that I tried to say it on radio the other night, it kind of fumbled it around, but an analogy that God was giving me as Brother Borg was giving this teaching that came to me, I think could be helpful to understand. If someone were to give me a car for free, and they fill it up with gas, and I I didn't have a car before, I needed that car, and I needed to get to some important place. That car would be all that I need to get to that place. But they might also give me some instructions to go along with it. In this manner is how you drive the car. In this manner is how you get to where you're going. It would come with instructions. And if I didn't follow those instructions, then I couldn't get the full benefit of having the car. I received it for free. It's fully sufficient in and of itself to get me where I'm going but I have to use it properly. And I think that having righteousness as a free gift, having relationship with God as a free gift, having victory over sin as a free gift, it comes with some instructions. Jesus gives some instructions about how to live in this new covenant. The Apostle Paul gives some instructions about how to walk with God. And we have instructions to pray. We have commands that tell us to pray, and we also have these commands that tell us in what manner we ought to pray. They tell us how to pray. And just like I couldn't get where I'm going in that car if I didn't follow the instructions that came with it, and I didn't operate it properly, and I didn't follow the directions that told me where to go, it's the same thing in receiving the full benefit of the new covenant. Even though I have everything as a free gift, even though it's all entirely 100% because of the blood of Jesus, and I receive it through faith alone, not by works of righteousness which I have done. The Bible does say that in Ephesians 2.10 that we're created unto good works. The purpose of these gifts that I have are that I would use them in good works. And there's a certain way that I ought to go about doing that. And as it regards prayer, there's a, I have relationship with God as a free gift. Through the blood of Jesus, I can go into His throne room through the veil. I can draw nigh unto Him. But there's instructions about how I should approach Him when I get there. Enter His courts with praise. Like Brother Borg taught about the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. And it's not a, a law for righteousness. It's not a law for victory. It's instructions about what to do with the victory and the righteousness and the relationship that you already have, about how to use the gift. And God was showing me this, and I can, I can feel the Holy Spirit moving on my heart even now, how important this is. If we want the full benefit of the new covenant, we have to follow all of the instructions. So I want to go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. And again, I'm not reteaching Brother Borg's teaching. I'm just, uh, if you can go ahead and click to the next one and the iPad doesn't, oh, there we go. Did you do that or did it work on mine? All right, I'm not teaching, reteaching Brother Borg's teaching, but I just want to hone in on this pray in this manner. Some things that God is showing me, and I think we can just keep pulling things out of here. You know, Dave Borg did such a good job pulling some things out here, but there's even more we can get out of it. So Matthew 6, 5. And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing... Hold on. Go to my paper here. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What can we take from that about in what manner we should pray? We should pray in such a manner that we're not praying to be seen of men. You hear the modern term virtue signaling. A lot of people, even Christians, we can do good things in front of people just so they can see us do good things. And they can talk about, oh, look how obedient he is. Look what a great job he's doing. And it doesn't mean there's something inherently wrong with praying in front of people 
you know, praying at a restaurant or at a family event. But we got to look into our heart and ask ourselves, am I doing this just so I can be seen of men? And if so, I'm not praying in the manner Jesus taught to pray. Instead, I'm praying like these hypocrites that he was speaking of. It's not about being seen doing right and obeying. It's about actually obeying. And when we actually have a heart of obedience, then we'll do that in secret and while we're being watched. So if we don't have that heart, we've got to ask God to help us with that if we're going to pray in the manner Jesus taught to pray. Verse 6, please. Matthew 6, 6. But you, when you pray, doesn't say if you pray, when you pray, it's assumed that we will pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut your door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and your Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. I ask the question to myself, what is the reward? What's the reward that the Father will reward me with as I pray to him in secret? And at a minimum, it has to be the things that Jesus taught in the Lord's Prayer to pray for. If he's saying pray and ask for this, then most certainly the reward of praying and asking for those things in secret is that God gives those things to me. And it really blesses me here that it says he will reward you openly. He'll bless me in such a way that others see it. And isn't that what we want? That's what we're praying for in this church, that God would let others see his kingdom through me, Christ in me. That others would see his will done in my life. Not so they can glorify me, but so they can see that God is real, that Jesus is alive. And he lives in the hearts of his people. He no longer dwells in a temple made with hands, but he dwells in these Christians. Look at them. They're being rewarded by him. And others would see his provision in our lives. They would see that sinners can be forgiven. They see that we're... I'm not sure how to say this. They see the most wretched sinner made whole, made right before God made new, and they see that guilt and shame removed. And they see, oh, there can be forgiveness for me too, because look, God has blessed him with forgiveness. Others see us being delivered from evil. It gives hope to them. Next verse, please. For all the promises of God in him, speaking of Jesus, in Jesus are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God. And the verse before this says, in Jesus it's not yea or nay. No, all the promises of God in Him are yea and amen. So what what is my reward for praying to the Father in secret? All the promises of God. Glory to God. Next slide, please, Ann. Notice there it says, unto the glory of God by us. When I see that, I think back to that, Him rewarding me openly for His glory. He will move in my life. He will let others see His kingdom, His Son, His mercy, His grace, His righteousness through me that He may be glorified. Next slide, going to Matthew 6, 7. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Remember that because the verses I'm going to read in the next slide connect back to that. We have to connect things as we study Scripture. So we have these hypocrites here, the heathen, and they think they'll be heard for their much speaking. Next slide, please. Verse 8. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray. He's setting up an argument here. This being the case, pray in this manner. It being the case that God already knows what you have need of, and the case that God won't hear you for your many words, pray in this manner. 
What can we draw from the immediate context of, that Jesus is leading into here about what manner we ought to pray in? Two points first off the bat. We should pray in such a manner that we're not trying to be heard for our many words. We're not using vain repetitions. We should also pray in such a manner that we're not just telling God everything that He already knows. He doesn't need a, a, an endless list. But I was thinking about this, and sometimes personally I, I have a problem with maybe I can try to think of God too theologically and forget that He's a person like us. He's our Father that I'm praying to. And the way my mind works, I'm just like, why should I tell Him anything if He already knows what I have need of? He knows what I'm going to say. Why? What's the point? I don't get it. Except for, of course, obedience, but is there any practical reason other than for me to just obey him? And I had this thought, what if I could read my children's hearts and minds, and I know already what they have need of, what they're thinking, would I want them to just never talk to me again because I already know what they're going to say? No, it's about relationship. He wants me because he's my father to come to him and tell him what I need. It's for me. So I can express my dependence on Him and I can speak to Him and know that He's heard me. And I can hear His voice in response. It's important that we do that. We don't get stuck in this thing of I don't need to pray because God already knows and He's sovereign and what will be, what will be. I said that wrong. What will be, will be. No, i got to talk to God. And we can, if you read the Old Testament, we can move God. And prayer is what moves Him. And we'll talk about different aspects of prayer that move Him. It's not a formula, but it is the instructions we're given in the New Covenant. I also had the thought that Galatians 6.15 says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but faith which worketh by love. Or I might have mixed that with Galatians 5. But the point is, is it's not about, how do I say this? I don't want to pray that I'm putting faith in my many words, but I also don't want to put faith in saying few words. It's not about how many words I say. That has nothing to do with it. I should use as many words or as little words as is necessary to convey, convey to my Father what I need to tell Him, being led of the Holy Spirit. I don't put my faith in these little things about how much time I spend praying. Oh, 30 minutes is the key, then God will listen. An hour is the key. No doubt, it's a great benefit to pray for 30 minutes or an hour, but it's not some kind of formula where He hears you for your much time or your many words and the things that you do. He hears you because He is who He is. Next slide, please. Notice I highlighted different words this time. All the promises of God in Him, in Christ. God hears me because of my position in Christ. And my position in Christ isn't about me being exalted to Christhood as they teach in Word of Faith. It's about me being crucified. And Christ being the one who now lives in me. It's about His righteousness being imputed to me. His righteousness is unto all and upon all them that believe. And when I am clothed with the righteousness of Christ, God will respond to my prayers, not because of me, the things I've done, the way that I pray by some formula. He'll respond to me because I'm clothed in the righteousness of His Son. And He honors that righteousness. He's well pleased with the Son. It's all about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Our faith should be anchored in Him. That's why God will answer our prayers. When we, as Pastor Mike so often says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. God will always honor the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus cannot fail. All the promises of God are yes. They cannot fail to give us the things that God promised us. The blood of Jesus can't fail 
to qualify us for those promises. Next slide, please. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Believe it. All the promises of God in Christ are yes. When we anchor our faith in Christ and Him crucified, it's easy to believe that. When my, when my faith is in something else, I don't ever know if that's going to be enough to merit the things that I'm asking God for. But I know that the cross was enough. I know that Jesus is enough. And when I anchor my faith in Him, I can pray in faith now. I can pray without doubt. Next verse, please. All the promises of God in Christ are yes. It is finished. He hath given us by His divine power. And we know in this church that the message of the cross is the power of God. Christ and Him crucified is the power of God. On the cross, Jesus purchased for us fully all that pertains to life and godliness. That's the reward that we can have praying to the Father in secret. He will secret. He will reward us openly with all that pertains to life and godliness. Next slide, please. Next slide. He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? If God gave us His Son, Jesus, on the cross, and Jesus paid the price with His blood, how can God not also freely give us all the things that Jesus purchased for us in the cross. All the promises of God in Him are yea and amen. It is finished. Next slide. This is James 5.16. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We know that as believers in Christ, we are righteous through Him. We're now justified by His blood. And i got to tell you, when I read some of these promises in here, I read that in Christ it's not yea and nay, it's just yes. And I consider that the blood of Jesus cannot fail for me to experience His kingdom come and His will be done. The blood of Jesus can't fail for God's will to be done in my life. The blood of Jesus can't fail for me to receive daily bread, forgiveness of sins. The blood of Jesus cannot fail. That makes my prayers fervent. Because I don't go to prayer trying to earn something, trying to work for it. I go to prayer knowing that all has already been given to me. Not in a weird, pretending, word of faith kind of way, but in a it is finished at the cross kind of way. I know God will is going to be done in my life. Next slide. You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. It doesn't say you have not because Jesus didn't finish it at the cross or it's not enough. It doesn't say you have not because you didn't do enough to earn it. You didn't do enough to work for it. You didn't do enough to deserve it. It says you have not because you ask not. Because the work is done, because the payment is made, because Jesus has done it all, all we have to do is ask. But we do have to ask. Because we have not, because we ask not. We have, the, we have the free gift. We have the relationship. We have the opportunity to go into the throne room of God and make these petitions for Him. Request that His kingdom come and His will be done. Request daily bread. Request forgiveness of sins. But if we don't ask, we won't have because He wants us to do it in that manner. Let's read through the Lord's Prayer real quick and then I'm just going to point out a couple things about it. Kind of already mentioned them. Next slide. 
Thy kingdom come. And I, I cut off. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Next slide. Is there another slide? These aren't all the promises of God, but we know that because Jesus listed these things in his prayer, these are promises of God. If we ask in secret, in the manner that Jesus taught, then His kingdom will come. And His will will be done in our lives. And just like Brother Borg taught, for now we have the first fruits of, our resurre- of the resurrection. For now, you know, Jesus isn't coming back fully. But we're praying for His kingdom to come in our lives and His will to be done in our lives as much as is possible in this church age. And in Christ, that promise is yes. And that gets me fired up when I really think about God's will can be done in my life. You know, I can ask Him for material things. I can lay out the specific things. God, I want this job. I want this to happen in my life. I want this to happen with my children, with my wife. And I don't know if I'm going to get those things or not. That's not what's promised, is my list of demands, but His will is promised. And that's even better than Him giving me my list of demands, because He knows what's best for me. That's better than winning the lottery. That's better than having a billion dollars. That's better than having all the material goods in this world, is that God's will would be done in my life. His will for us is sanctification. His will for us is that we're conformed into the image of Christ. That's just a few things. What a glorious thing to know that I can ask God for His will to be done in my life and know that because of Christ and Him crucified, I can have that. I can have all things that I need. And so that's that's my word for you today. There is a manner in which we should pray, a how to do it, And if we do that, God will reward us openly. And the reward is, I don't even have the words for it. We we tend to just kind of minimize these things in our head. But the reward is all that Jesus paid for on the cross. All the benefits of the new covenant. The presence of God in me. Freedom from sin. Victory. Healing. Whatever it may be, whatever God wants to do to glorify Himself on this earth and show the people of this earth and the people in my life the power of His kingdom in my heart, that's what I can have through prayer. So I just want to conclude this little short message with a prayer. And then as I said, we're going to break up into groups and just as we've done the last couple times, um, just kind of share with each other. And I I have some pre-made questions up on the slides.